It's the 13th of April, 2021, and in Thailand it's uh, Songkran Day, the Thai New Year. It's a day where people come together to show respect uh, for each other. And, uh, they pour water over the monks' hands or over Buddha images and ask for blessings from their elders. It's quite similar to the family day during Chinese New Year. They give show respects to one another. There's also sharing, uh, giving, and uh, the elders give their blessings to children and grandchildren. And so we see the time passes by very quickly. It's been one whole year since the last Thai New Year. And all of the feelings, all of the emotions that have come up, all the happiness that we have experienced over this past year, all of the sadness and the sorrow, all of this has arisen and it's also ceased already. And this is the nature of the Dhamma, that it's true in this way, that all physicality arises and ceases, that this body decays and degenerates with each passing breath. And also for the mental uh, factors, Vedana feeling, with the happy feelings or unhappy feelings, these too arise and cease. Memories arise and cease. All the thoughts and the proliferation of the mind, this comes and goes. All the feelings that we experience, the sensations that we experience when our eyes sees a form, or our ears hear sounds, odors, uh, contact, our nose, the tongue tastes, flavors, or there's tactile, tactile sensations contacting the body, or thoughts, emotions arising in the heart, these all arise and cease. And if our mind is in quite a subtle state, if it has samadhi, then we'll be able to contemplate here at these senses, seeing that all of these sense objects, they arise and cease. And in doing just that, we attain to the Dhamma, can become a stream entry, a uh, once returner, a non returner, or an arahant. It's possible to abandon attachment in this way. And if our wisdom is clear, or it's uh, quite strong, then we gain this clear knowledge right here. But this depends upon the strength of our samadhi. Being able to see into the truth in this way depends upon the collectedness of our minds. So for us, we all have sila. We have this virtue, caring for our actions of body and speech, looking after them well. Uh, but this samadhi is something that we need to train in. And we do that uh, through developing mindfulness, trying to keep our mindfulness with us continuously. Why do we need to do this? Well, it's because all of the sense objects that we experience, these are like water that's flowing in a stream. And if we have a dam wall, then that is able to prevent this water from flooding the fields. And so with all these sense objects that flow into the mind, if we have mindfulness there knowing, then we'll be able to manage them well. So for us, we can manage our actions of body and speech, but oftentimes our hearts are another matter. They can be quite chaotic. So we need to try to train them, to bring them to peace. This is something that can be quite difficult because we've never trained in it before. We do have some kind of mindfulness, however, but this is a mindfulness that we've been using uh, in our education. We have mindfulness, and this can help with our memory. But this is just a, a normal kind of mindfulness, a, a normal kind of memory. So there's mindfulness and there's samadhi there within our studies and our education. Some people have good memories, some people not so good memories. But this also uh, depends upon our efforts as well. A part of that depends upon the natural mindfulness and wisdom of our brains, and another portion depends upon our efforts. Because there are some people who, even though they have a good memory, um, still they get distracted and amused 
by all the various pleasures of this world. And so that um, lessens the strength of their memory. And some people may have a very good memory, but they don't have much interest or sincerity in their studies. They just get delighted by this uh, stream of worldly events. So they don't study well. They don't gain much success in their work. Uh, But for those people who train themselves in mindfulness through meditation, um, they're developing mindfulness to a higher level. But this really does need a sincerity of efforts. We need to put in our energy to it. And um, we see the drawbacks of a mind that has attachment. Attachment to anything at all. This all has its drawbacks. Things that have a mind there that have sentient objects or non-sentient objects. The mind attaches to all of them. And then when it has this attachment and these things, they change, um, then the mind isn't able to accept that. It, doesn't, it isn't wise to that change. And so it suffers as a result. And Lumpur Cha, he gave quite a good example of this. He said it's like we have one glass. And if we use that glass with wisdom, we contemplate it as well and seeing that the glass is already broken. Then when one day something happens, Maybe we don't pick it up so well and it slips. Maybe a cat knocks it over, a child knocks it over, or maybe a strong wind blows and that grass breaks. We won't suffer because we already know, and we have already known, that that glass is already broken. But another person uses that glass with heedlessness. They forget and they don't contemplate um, its nature to break. And so when change arises in that thing, then their minds aren't quick enough to deal with it. And they suffer as a result. And just like how even very strong buildings, it's possible for them to get damaged. Uh, Maybe there's a gas tank and that explodes, causing a fire um, in their place. And people can die. Recently there was an event of this, that five people died and five people were injured. And these accidents can happen. Even though they may be very unlikely, they're still possible. In this life, it's not sure. And so when people travel home, it's possible they may not reach their house. And do we know that perhaps we may die today? And for those people who have died, If they look back one year or longer into the past, there was no thought that maybe on this day they would pass away. Life is not sure. And so we don't know when this death is going to come to us. We may be even driving a very large car and uh, we feel like we don't have to be afraid or be worried about many of the other vehicles on the road, bicycles and motorbikes, this can't cause us any damage. But it's still possible for very large cars to have accidents and for the people in them to die. These things are not sure. So we should contemplate. They're not sure. These things are inconstant. They're unstable. When we have things, when there's any materiality that we gain, any objects, then we may be happy because of our gain. But we won't, these things won't be a cause of happiness forever because they are of the nature to change, following causes and conditions. They are a Nietzsche. These things are unstable. They're inconstant. So this is something that we need to contemplate constantly, that these things are not sure. These things are unstable. And whatever we have, we use those things with mindfulness and wisdom. And just like how when we use that glass, We see that it's already broken, and so we don't suffer. But for people who don't have wisdom, they use their possessions with attachment. And when those things change, then suffering arises in the heart. So we need to contemplate. We need to put our wisdom into use. And even though we may just have a small amount of samadhi, we can still use that to um, see 
to contemplate, to gain wisdom, so that we can accept the truth. If our minds are grounded in just kanaka samadhi, this minor form of samadhi, then just a minor amount of wisdom will arise. And the sights, the insights that we gain, they're not clear. But if we have upajara samadhi, this neighborhood concentration, then the qualities of this, or the way that this manifests in the body, is of the body swaying to and fro, maybe tears flowing. The body can feel like it grows very tall or very large, and joy arises in the heart. There's a great sense of inner coolness and ease. There's a sense of inner satisfaction. And the body feels very light, as though there's no body there at all. When we walk, then it feels very buoyant, and when we come to sit, it feels like the body disappears. It's very at ease. And um, this shows that it's this feeling of self in the body that causes this heaviness. And uh, the body, it may be heavy, but when the mind is light, um, then the body, it's like it loses its weight. Even though it still has some weight to it, uh, physically, um, the mind doesn't really pick up that weight. It feels like it's very light, very at ease. When the mind comes together at just one point, even though our bodies may weigh 60 kilograms, um, when we walk, there's no feeling of that weight. So this shows us that the body is pulled downwards um, by the Earth's gravity. And our minds can pick up on this. They can receive that sensation of being pulled. And this is what gives us the feeling of weight, whether it's a lot of weight or whether it's a little bit of weight. But when the mind is in a still space, then it doesn't feel that heaviness. It doesn't feel any weight. And whether we're walking, standing, sitting, lying down, there's a sense of buoyancy, like there's no body there at all. And this is what being in Upajara Samadhi can be like. And perhaps we can stay in this space for half an hour or one hour. But if it's Kanaka Samadhi, then it's not long. It just comes up for a flash, for a moment. And then after that moment, the defilements arise once again. The heart starts clinging once again. And uh, wisdom can come up for just a few moments. And this wisdom and clinging, they fight against each other like this. There's the clinging on one side and there's knowledge on the other side that extracts this attachment. And these two, they struggle against each other. So developing samadhi is a necessity. It's a part of this noble eightfold path that we can summarize as sila, samadhi, and banya, as virtue, collectedness of heart, and of wisdom. And if we have this level of upajara samadhi, then the opportunity we have to understanding and experiencing the Dhamma is quite good. It's easier to experience the Dhamma in this state. But it's also natural for many of us that on some days we'll have samadhi and on some days we won't. At times the mind gathers together and we can gain knowledge, we can gain uh, clarity and uh, see that there isn't, isn't really a self there. The mind can become very bright, uh, perhaps for one day or for half a day. It can even come up for three days and three nights. That there's this inner radiance to the mind for this whole time. But in the beginning, however, we don't have samadhi with us constantly. Some days we may be able to reach samadhi for 30 minutes. The body and the mind feel very light, but then the mind starts to think once again. But if we can stay with our mindfulness while it's thinking, then we can gain knowledge. We can gain clarity over the nature of our thoughts. So there were many monks and nuns who became arahants. And this was due to the level of their samadhi, that they had developed their samadhi to a very complete stage. And sometimes, even though there is this very strong samadhi, it's possible to suffer quite a lot. When the mind is very established in samadhi, there can also be a lot of 
well-established suffering, a lot of uh, very strong sorrow as well. But they have a good foundation to their hearts. There's the samadhi, and then they contemplate uh, based on that, and wisdom can arise, and they can attain to the Dhamma. So there was one bhikkhuni who was washing her feet, and then she watched as the water it flowed down and drained into the sand and disappeared. And this happened one time, and then she took another uh, scoop of water and washed her feet, and then watched as the water trickled away into the sand. And then a third time, she watched as the water disappeared down into the sand. And she reflected, reflected upon life, that it's something that's not sure. But death is sure that our lives must end in death. And through contemplating this, she attained to arahantship. And some people ask, well, while she was washing her feet and she watched this water flow into the sand, did she have samadhi? And the answer is that she did. And she had this energy there of samadhi. And this was very full in her heart. And even when she was standing, sitting, walking, lying down, even when she was speaking, um, the mind was detached from these events, and it was still very peaceful. And it's possible, even while we're speaking, for the heart to be very peaceful as well. Whenever uh, she saw a sight, heard a sound, tasted something, uh, felt something, the mind was still at peace and at ease. So was able, she was able to contemplate into the nature of deterioration, of degeneration. And through doing this, she became an arahant. And this depended upon the energy of her samadhi. So therefore, training ourselves in samadhi is important. And just like how we come together like this, like we are now, practicing in this way, whether we're standing, we're sitting, we're walking, we're lying down, we should train ourselves, developing samadhi. Always be developing this, always be contemplating. Seeing that life is not sure, but death is something that's sure. Contemplating in this way. Seeing that the body is just a collection of elements that follows nature. Now everything arises and ceases. And we take this arising and ceasing as the objects of our mind. This anicca, this is using an object of wisdom. So we try and develop this path, abandoning um, harmful actions, cultivating skillfulness, and making the mind bright and pure. We train in this way, and we just carry on doing it, carry on doing it, bit by bit, day by day. And in the end, the mind will come together, and we'll see clearly, we'll see into the Dhamma. But this seeing into the Dhamma, it needs to have a basis of energy, energy of mindfulness, energy of samadhi. These things need to gather together. So sometimes we experience peace in our practice, and sometimes not. But don't worry about that. As we carry on practicing, then one day the mind will come together and we'll see clearly. We'll see into the nature of all material things see into the nature of this body, that it's not self. We'll see how all these things are just conventions, conventions that are unreal, and the mind attains uh, and becomes liberated. And this may happen for three days and three nights, that the mind is very bright, there's a great sense of inner joy, and the faith that we have in the Buddha Sasana is firm and unshakable. It's possible for this to arise for each and every one of us. So I ask for all of you to set your hearts on this, to carry on, to not retreat. And why is that? Because life is not sure. So we see in this present day and age, with the pandemic that's going around, there are many people who um, are free from this illness, but there are also many people who have died from it as well. Um, but even if we do um, get these illnesses, then this is something that's just uh, temporary. Oh, sorry, if we're freed from these illnesses, if we cure ourselves from them, it's just a temporary relief. Uh, because we're actually not freed from death, 
that all of us need to die. And if we look into the future, 50 years, 100 years from now, then everyone in this world will have died. No one will be left. If we think in this way, contemplate in this way, um, and ask ourselves, well, who will be left in that time? We see that everyone will have died, and the mind can become quite dispassionate, disillusioned, it can sober up. Ask ourselves, who will be left? That everyone, all the people, will have to die. And when we say that this person's like this, that that person's like that, these are just conventions. And these are just things that the mind creates. But those people who are wise, they'll know how to develop Barami. And even in different difficult times such as these, it's actually possible to develop Barami even more than in normal times. Those with intelligence can do this. We have more opportunity to help out, to give a lending, to lend a hand to others in society. We still have an opportunity to cultivate our sila, to be generous, to develop meditation. We see that the purpose of this life is to develop Barami, to be generous, to help each other out, to meditate. Just like how there are many lay people who are supporting the monks to meditate, offering the four requisites. Um, and now this monastery is closed because of COVID. And so there are many people who are helping out, um, offering the four requisites to the monks in the monastery so that the monks here are able to stay safe. So it's possible for people to develop their barami like this. And we also use this opportunity to practice as well. So we see that those people who have good virtue, um, they are the people who stay safe. But we also need to have mindfulness, so we need to be cautious and alert as well to not be heedless. So all of the lay people and the monks here in the monastery should be wearing face masks. We shouldn't be heedless. And we shouldn't take the masks off because it's not sure. We don't know whether we've contracted COVID or not. And we should just assume that we have. And so when we go on arms round, make sure to be wearing a mask all the time. If the lay people offering food don't have a mask, then we can give one to them. And we shouldn't be speaking much either. So when we do this, then we can stay safe. And those people who are cautious, um, they're the ones who do stay safe. And we see that things really aren't sure. And sometimes there are even people staying in quite a secluded place. They stay out in the forest. And it's very unlikely that they'll contract this disease, but still sometimes they can get it. And so we really need to take up this principle of uncertainty. These things are unsure. We need to be cautious. Even some people, they just stay by themselves, but um, they get it all the same. So we shouldn't be heedless. And we need to help ourselves out as well. So some people ask, well, if we have faith in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, then don't these things help us? But it's not like that, because the Buddha, he taught us to not be heedless. And if we're not heedless, um, then it's unlikely then we'll get this disease. So we put our efforts into cultivating mindfulness, into developing samadhi, into cultivating our minds. And then one day the mind gathers together and we understand into the Dhamma. So I ask for all of you to train like this, to Bring up mindfulness so it's complete, so that samadhi becomes well established and wisdom arises. And put your efforts into abandoning this attachment so that it lessens and lessens. The reason that we suffer is because of attachment. The reason that that suffering is drawn out is because of our desires. So when we know this, when we know that we suffer because of our attachments, then we can also fix the situation, we can solve it. When we attach to a self, then there's a me and there's a mind that's there. So we should use our mindfulness to, or our samadhi to contemplate and do this every single day. 
be constantly abandoning attachments, be doing this little by little, and eventually we'll be able to let go of them to a significant degree. And here there's no more eighth birth. So during the day we should be chanting Itipiso, do this 108 times for three rounds or seven rounds or ten rounds, and this gives us great benefit. It gives us a lot of mindfulness while we're chanting. And this is also something that we can use to measure our minds, to measure what they're like, how much thinking that's going on. And if we don't have any standard of measurement, then it's possible for us to just allow our minds to be thinking all throughout the day. And so may um, all of you be sincerely firm in this path of practice. <laughs>